You're gonna be in it. I'm in it. <laughs> no, you're not in it. You're gonna be in it. I'm standing right here. Yeah, okay. We're gonna be teaching this. Cool. This <laughs> not doing it without you. Okay, praise God. So here we are. Uh, praise God, Brother Ron and I. We are here. We are um, doing a teaching today on the limitless foreknowledge of God. Amen. Right, brother? Amen. The limitless foreknowledge of God. Uh, we are here to refute to you today this unbiblical um, doctrine of open theism. And we're going to show you how unbiblical this concept is. And by the way, thank you for everybody that's been praying for my back. Um, I still, I'm still going through pain when I walk and things, but uh, I, I'm able to stand right here and, and do this teaching, and I'm feeling a little bit better today, praise God. So just please continue to pray for that, the healing of my back. Um, and so, praise God, we're just going to get right into this teaching. So, God is, God's knowledge is limitless, and we're going to prove that uh, through several scriptures. Uh, we're not only going to prove that God's knowledge is limitless, we're also going to prove that God is limitless for knowledge. And the main point that uh, open theists try to make is that um, God doesn't know the future. God does not determine the future of free moral agents. That's these are the, the or God does not know the future of free moral agents. Um, these are the points that they make. Um, God is learning as we are learning about things. Um, this and all this came from from Pinnock. Uh, was it Chuck Pinnock? I believe so. He uh, he. This came you know earlier in the century from Chuck Pinnock. A lot of this has derived within the last hundred something years. This is not uh, uh, this, the, you, hundreds of years ago. This was un, unheard of that people would even be arguing that God's uh, knowledge is, is somehow limited, or exactly. foreknowledge is somehow limited. Exactly. It's, it's a ridiculous concept. Um, God knows the end from the beginning. It says in Isaiah, for the words out on the board, Isaiah 46, verse 10, that God knows the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that have not yet come to pass. So God's knowledge has no limits. At all, zero limits. He's not bound by, uh, you know, certain limitations. God's knowledge is not bound by these things. So God has unlimited knowledge about future events. Um, we know that all throughout the prophets. It's almost, brothers and sisters, it's it's almost sad that Brother Ron and I have to get up here and defend. The limitless foreknowledge of God. It's ridiculous. It almost makes me frustrated, brother, because yeah. we should be talking about something else. Exactly. But because this is starting to become a thing to where people are doubting whether or not God knows the future or not, we got to get up here and show you literally. And if we wrote all, all the scriptures, we would the have. room itself would not be able to contain the number of scriptures that we would have. There are so many scriptures about how God knows the future. All the prophets were prophesying about the future. Exactly. Who gave those prophets the wisdom? Amos 3.7 says that God does nothing, but that he revealeth it unto his servants, the prophets. So all the prophets and the knowledge of the prophets come from the mind of God. So, I mean... I'm frustrated in, this, in the sense that we have to get up here and even talk about whether or not God doesn't know the future about things. It's absolutely frustrating. God is not a man, Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. God is not a man. He doesn't think like a man. He doesn't act like a man. Okay? Just because we're made in the image of God and God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, it doesn't mean that God is limited to the same brain that we have. Exactly. So people don't need to understand three major 
three major things that people need to understand about the attributes of God. There is that God is, there's 26 attributes of God. And one of these days we're going to go through all of them. But these are the main attributes that, that completely God. refute open theism. Yep. And if you're a proponent to this and somebody's been teaching you open theism, you need to reject it. You need to get back to the Bible. You need to get back to the attributes of God. And you need to study the word. Don't go off what this guy says, what, you know, some scholar said 300 years ago. Go back to the Bible. What does it say? God is omniscient, meaning he has all knowledge, okay? He has limitless foreknowledge. This is knowledge about the future. God has limitless knowledge about the future. It's one of the attributes of God. God transcends or goes beyond the limits of, of our universal nature. It means God is not inside the universe. God transcends the universe. God's able to go through it, out of it. He's above it. He's not affected by it. Meaning he's not affected by time. Now we know from Einstein, brother, mm -hmm. that time is part of the fabric of space. Right. Right. And, and, and it's not that Einstein created this it was just that it's always been there and he discovered it yeah, got a lot of to figure it out but he, he he discovered that that time is affected by the fabric of space and that time is a creation it's not something that is above space that just monitors or measures it it's a part of it Amen. meaning time is a creation of god meaning god is not affected by time right he's not affected by it he transcends it. And so they reject these major characteristics about the nature of God. The transcendence, the foreknowledge, and the omniscience of God. And if you reject these, you're obviously going to fall into error. You're obviously going to fall into error. I just wanna, and that's what we're refuting right now. I just want to um, say something really quick. Okay. Um, a lot of people, and you know, I'm not going to say a lot of people, but what I've seen and what I've heard so far from people who do believe in open theism doesn't just stop here they also tend to uh, reject original sin so this is not just um, one doctrine that they just latch on to and then tries to you know move it forward after that no they they end up rejecting a whole lot of other things so just like how brother matthew said it's a basket of doctrine. Exactly, False doctrines. exactly if, if you're if you're being taught this doctrine just Understand that whoever is teaching you this, or wherever you're listening, where uh, uh, where this is being taught, something else is also being taught that you probably haven't understood yet, or probably haven't heard yet. But be aware that um, in the times that we're living in, it should be no surprise that the the attributes of God, the doctrines of the Bible, salvation issues are going to be under attack, and so we need to be aware. So I'm really glad that. You, we're doing this teaching, so we're going to main, mainly where we brought out the major scriptures here. Like I said, we could fill this entire wall with scriptures about how that God knows the future, okay, and that God knows what people are going to do. But we brought out the major ones here. We're going to look at a few categories. We're going to look here about the prophecies that Jesus Christ individually gave. We're going to look at some about Abraham. I actually want to go to this one next. We're going to look at uh, the Psalms. We're going to look at Hebrews. We're going to look at that one out of Jeremiah that they love to use. Jeremiah 32, 25, where it talks about the idols and the, and the sacrifices. So, I want to start over here with Abraham. Because this is the one that a lot of people love to latch on to. This one right here. Abraham's about to offer up Isaac. He's about to bring the knife down. And what happens? The angel stops him. He says, don't do it. Don't lay your hand upon the son. Why? Because now I know that you will not withhold your only son. Let me read that scripture, brother. Read that. So this is Genesis chapter tw uh, 22, verse 11 to 14. Yes. It says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know. There's the, there's the key yes. thing. I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, 
behind him a ram caught in a thicket by, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of, it, in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. So, but the key verse that we're looking at is verse 12, where it says, I know. But now I know. And we look at the Hebrew word, that Hebrew word is yadai. Now, or yada is pronounced, you know, in, in how we pronounce it. But if you look at that same Hebrew word, it's literally the same Hebrew word that is used for Adam knowing Eve as wife. Okay, so this is a, a not a, this is not just about knowledge of something factual. It's not about factual things. It's not that God had to find out a fact about Abraham. It was that this is about relationship and acquaintance. It's about being acquainted with Abraham in the sacrificing of his son. Amen. You're being acquainted with it. Why did God allow Abraham to even put his son on the altar? Because he was fulfilling a type. It was all about typology. Okay? God had Israel do many type things. It was set up pillars in certain places. The Gilgal, the circle of stones. Many things that God had them do as a typology. Amen. Okay? To, uh, as a memorial. And we know that Mount Moriah was where Christ was crucified some 2,500 years later, 2,200 years later. And so um, this is not that God found out something factual about Abraham he didn't know. Right. Because we're going to look at all the other different places where God did have all the facts pre in advance. Knew exactly what they were going to do. Exactly. God didn't discover something about Abraham. God was allowing Abraham to be in that acquaintance with him in the sacrifice. It was about fulfilling the typology. And it was about setting up a memorial. It said, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. It was a prophecy that God was giving. Okay, so Abraham was fulfilling a prophetic work. It was a prophetic work about something that was coming future. And so don't use this verse to try to tell me that God didn't know what Abraham was going to do. It's not scriptural, and that's not what it means. Okay? God did know exactly what was going to happen. And if you look at Genesis 4, verse 9, there's another use of the word yadai. And it was when God asked Cain... Where is Abel your brother? Now, we already know God knew where Abel was. Why? Because in the same passage, he says later, the voice of your brother's blood cries to me from what? The ground. God knew what Cain had done. For one, God's not blind. Exactly. So he saw it happening in real time. So it wasn't that God was trying to get Cain to... Tell him where Abel was because now Abel's lost and I can't find him. Right. You really think that's what that means? <laughs> no, he was allowing Cain the opportunity, brothers and sisters. Now, this might be controversial. But he was allowing Cain the opportunity to confess his sin. I believe, I believe, and I can use the Bible to support this, that if Cain had looked up to God and said, God... The reason why you can't find Abel is because I killed him. And he had brought the sacrifice and laid the sacrifice out and said, God, here's a blood sacrifice. I'm sorry. I, I, I've sinned. I killed Abel, my brother. Will you please have mercy upon me? I believe he would have. I believe God would have had mercy on Cain. I believe God would have had mercy on Cain because God's not a respecter of persons. And in every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted with him. God taught Adam and Eve how to sacrifice. Even after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He taught them the sacrificial system because that was how the atonement was to be made. And it was how they were reconciled to God. And so, if Cain had confessed and God was giving him that opportunity in that statement to confess, I believe, then we would have had a different story. Maybe we wouldn't have had Seth. I don't know. I don't... And I don't predetermine, you know, the mind of God. God has, it, it, I don't know how it would have turned out. Maybe we would have still had Seth. But the whole thing is, is that 
God knew where Abel was, is the point I'm making. Amen. God knew exactly where he was. He knew he was dead. And he knew that Cain killed him. And so we can't use these scriptures where God's asking a question, you know, to say, well, God has, doesn't have the facts about something. It's, not, it's not just true. not biblical. It's not biblical. Look at the life of Christ, brother. Look at the life of Christ. We have the, uh, he predicted that there would be where a, the, the upper room was going to be. He predicted that the, 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 they were going to unloose the ass from the master and, and lead it away. Yep. And the, the guy was going to say, what are you doing with it? Where are you taking the colt? <laughs> he, he talked, I mean, just, in, you know, he talked about Peter's denial, right, brother? Exactly. I mean, even in, in if you guys go to uh, uh, Luke chapter 22 uh, and read from verse 31 to 62, Jesus literally tells Peter, you're going to deny me. If, if God doesn't know the future, if he doesn't know about what things are going to happen in the future, how, how is this possible? It's just, it's no, I the, knew the future. It's, here's another thing about this passage that's important, about Peter. Peter is a very good one. Because God, knowing the future on that, had to be determined upon man's decision. Because it, it involved a man's choice. It, exactly. Okay, so Peter would have had to have chosen to deny God, okay, for God to get that right. And yet he still got it right. Yep. God still was able to predict it, even though it was based upon a human decision. It was still based on a human decision, yet still God was able to predict in detail what was going to happen. Brothers and sisters, you've got to get out of this mentality that God is somehow limited to a human mind or that God is somehow like us. in this universe or that God is like a man. Psalm it says in Psalm 50, is if you thought I was such, a, a, all, such an altogether, such as one as thyself, he said. So that, read, read that. Yeah, I'm so, gonna, I'm you gonna thought read I was that. like you. That's God, God's saying in Psalm 50, he said, you thought I was just like you. I'm not. Okay. If there was a cattle and I, if I'm hungry, I don't ask you because I don't, I don't need you. I have all the cattle on a thousand hills. And it's about man, God's sufficiency outside of man. It's at verse 21 of Psalm 50. Yeah. It says, These things thou hast done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. Yeah. But I will reprove thee and set them in order for the night. He's declaring that I'm not like you. I'm not like you. My ways are higher than your ways. In fact, that's another scripture. Right? <laughs> Isaiah 55. He said, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So get out of this mentality that God is somehow going through time with us. That was Isaiah 55, 9. Yep. Get out of this mentality that God is somehow experiencing, you know, like things us. with us right now. Like we're all going into this. We're in together, God. We're all just going in it together. Yes, God is with us. He's the Parakletos, the Holy Spirit's with us and guides us into all truth. But God already knows what's going to happen because he transcends it. He transcends the universe. Amen. Okay, that's what people have to understand. He transcends it. Uh, he talked about the upper, upper room, the betrayal of Judas. That was fulfilling a prophecy of what, brother? Psalm 55, where he said, he that, had, uh, he that lifted up his heel against me. He Amen. that had broken bread with me had lifted up his heel, heel against, against me. me. That's right. This is a prophecy. And actually, if you go back to the psalm, when David was writing this, he was actually writing about Ahithophel. He was actually writing about the betrayal of Ahithophel. But it actually perfectly goes right into this too, about the betrayal of Ahithophel. See, Jesus was being acquainted with what David also went through in the betrayal from Ahithophel. And I just want to, and, and we, we wrote it here, just like how you were talking about this Hebrew word, yada, yeah. which it literally means acquaintance or relationships. Like, yes. I just want to, you know, say something from earlier about in Genesis as well. God didn't look at Abraham and say, wow, Abraham, that's a good idea. You're going to sacrifice your son. Let me, I'm going to just do that too with my son in the future. <laughs> like, no, there was, a, on, there was a reason. God knew what was going to happen because he had already purposed it. He had already planned it. Um, should we just give him the gold mine now or should we just wait? I'm going to come back to John 16, 13. Okay. I want to go to Deuteronomy 18 Let me flip where God says he predicts Israel's fall. 
He says, when you go into the land of milk and honey, he said, I know that you are going to go back and be turned back and to go into other gods. Read the actual, I paraphrase it. Why don't you read it, brother? Deuteronomy 18. I believe, 20. let me see. He predicted Israel's demise. He predicted their fall. He predicted the fact that they would break the covenant. Th this one right here, brother, Deuteronomy yeah. is about um, oh, how read that one. It's, a different, it's a different verse. Read that one. That was Deuteronomy 31. I'm sorry. Yeah. It says, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But that prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. And what this is saying is, if a man claims to be speaking on behalf of God and it does not come to pass, then God has not given this man a word. But just like how we quoted in the book of Amos that God only gives a message. Of, what does it say, brother? God uh, servants the prophet. He, he reveals the it. Does nothing. Exactly. And so if, if what a man is saying does not come to pass, that means God did not give it. Because only God can give what he knows because he possesses The whole it. concept of prophecy depends on the limitless foreknowledge. Amen. I mean, there is no prophecy without the limitless foreknowledge of God. So we have to just completely dismiss that altogether. 1 Kings 13, we know there was a prophecy given about Josiah, King Josiah that was going to be born. That was given by the man of God who went up to Bethel. Um, that was fulfilled 262 years later, I believe. Uh, Josiah was born. He was the reformer. He said that Josiah was actually going to burn the bones of Jeroboam on the altar. Uh, all these things came to pass, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, Isaiah 45 talks about Cyrus, okay? Uh, King Cyrus, um, you know, being commissioned to rebuild. This was, a, this was a Gentile king, okay? Prophesied by the prophet Isaiah that he was going to build the temple, the second temple after it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, all of these were fulfilled exactly as Isaiah predicted it would be. And this was before Cyrus was even born. Amen. Because this was given in 745 something BC. And Cyrus wasn't born until the 400s. I mean, brothers and sisters, you, you can't make that up. I mean, you can't, you couldn't even invent this book. It, you couldn't write the Bible as a novel. It would be like you couldn't do it because there's too many interconnected uh, prophecies. Right. But you, you, you couldn't even predict it all. If, if God possible. doesn't know the future, then what is the book of Revelation for, brother? It's all about the future. What is it for? All we, about we might as well just cut out the whole book of Revelation. Exactly. Today. Exactly. And then uh, looking at... Psalm 119.89, it said, Forever thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. The word of God is settled in heaven. He said, I'm the Lord, I do not change, he said in Malachi. Yep, that's it right there. And so, the main things that open theists like to say is, is that there's no way because if, if our free will, if we're truly free, God cannot influence our decisions. There's no way that if we're truly free, God could possibly know what we are going to do. See, that's just not that, that. There's a fallacy in that. There's a there's a there's a disconnect in that. I can drop this this marker. God's going to know whether or not I'm going to drop this marker, but I'm still making the decision to drop that marker. Amen. I did that. God did not make me drop that marker. God did not make me drop this marker. I dropped. Did God know it was going to fall? Yes, of course. He knew it was going to hit the ground. God did not influence me in any way to drop this. And so I dropped it. That is the foreknowledge of God. Amen. God foresees the end from the beginning. What verse is that, brother? That's 46.10. Isaiah 46.10. Exodus 3.19. Exodus 3.19. God said... To Moses, there, this is another very, very important scripture. God says to Moses, 
I know that Pharaoh will not let you go. I believe this was after the, I forget what it was, whether the but third the plague, plague, the second or third plague. 319. It was either the water turning to blood. There's 10 of them, and I always forget the order. It's right before it turns, um, Moses' rod turns into a serpent. Okay. He said, I know, no matter what you do, you can throw the, you can throw the rod on the ground, it become a serpent. I know that Pharaoh's not going to let you go. Was Pharaoh a free creature? He was. Of course he was. He's a free moral agent. Yet God predicted that Pharaoh was not going to let Moses or the people of Israel go. So that was another, that was another prophecy that depended upon a human decision. The outcome depended upon a human decision. Pharaoh had to make the conscious decision not to let the children of Israel go. Yet, God was able to accurately predict it. Yep. It's just so clear. Matthew chapter 12, 25, what does it say? Jesus read their thoughts. Jesus read their thoughts. Or what they were thinking. Jesus knew what they were thinking in their mind. It says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself sh shall not stand. So here we're talking about how Jesus is knowing somebody's thoughts that they're thinking in their mind. Yet God doesn't know the future. So he's a mind reader, but he can't. <laughs> <laughs> he's able to read a person's thoughts. But he cannot foretell the future. It's like you're putting God into a box. Yeah. You're boxing up God is what you're doing. A so box that they... God, need. this is where you belong. We're going to go ahead and put you in here. We're going to put a little lock and key on it too. Let's put a little lock and key on God's box. You know? you got to have this key, Lord God, to open it up, okay? You can't draw keys. <laughs> anyway, there's a lock on God's box and... God, you're in this box, and you're not coming out because we can't change. We can't have you coming out here changing what you know. We'll we'll give you the characteristics that we like. Yeah. This is a mischaracterization of God. Brothers. They're forming their own God. This is a mischaracterization of God. If you think somehow that God's knowledge is limited, or that God cannot know the future, or that God learns along with us, see that's another thing. God never learns anything. If he learns something, then he's not all-knowing. I can't know everything and then learn something tomorrow. Right. Right? Right. I either know everything or I don't. Right. So I can't, I can't know everything about everything and then, oh, I just learned something new. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> you, a know-it-all can never say, I didn't know that. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Yeah. And God doesn't lie. Deuteronomy uh, 31, brother. Let's go, there. Let's go to Deuteronomy 31. Let's take a look at that scripture. Deuteronomy 31, verse... Uh, it was 31... We didn't actually write it on the board. It was 3120. 31. Deuteronomy 3120. Let's read that. Yep, that's right. De Deuteronomy 31, verse 20. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves, and wax and fat, then will they turn unto other gods, and serve them, and provoke me, and break my covenant. He's speaking about something that is going to happen in the future. He said, you're going to break my covenant. They're going to break it. You haven't even broken it yet, but you're going to break my covenant. That's a good guess. And it, 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 it's not a good guess, because <laughs> he's guessed too many times for it to be a good guess, <laughs> exactly. brothers and sisters. That's the problem. Exactly. He's guessed too many times for it to be a good guess. Because he's literally done it hundreds of times in the scripture. Like I said, we could fill this entire wall with all the times that God predicted the future. He can't be right, you know, by luck and fortune that many times. He knows what's going to happen. Psalm 78, 41, it says, They limited the Holy One of Israel. When you say that God's knowledge is limited, you are placing limits on God. You are limiting the Holy One of Israel, and you could, in a sense, be bringing the wrath of God upon you, like Israel did. It says they limited the Holy One of Israel. That is a sin. It says, uh, I'm about to just read that, because that's, that's really great. Because Israel was punished for doing this. Yeah, read really it. Great. 
Psalm 78. I'm going to actually start in verse um, yes. 37. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yet many a time turned he his anger away and did not serve all of his wrath. For he remembered that they were but a flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. What happened, brother? Because that, that, that passage is about Numbers 11. What happened in Numbers 11? Do you remember what happened? Let's find out. They said, is God able to furnish a table in the wilderness? Can he give us flesh to eat? Is God able to feed us? Mm. Are the, are the flocks and the herds of the earth going to have to be slaughtered Amen. so that we can eat? Amen. See, what you do Amen. is, when you're an open theist, brothers and sisters, you are limiting God and you are doubting God. That's what it is. You're doubting God. That's what it is. You're doubting God's ability to know something. And that, brothers and sisters, is a sin. I'm just going to come out and say it. It is a sin to doubt. It's a lack of faith. Mm -hmm. It is a lack of confidence in God, your Savior. You're placing God in a box. You're limiting him. You're doubting him. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin, the, the Bible says. Amen, brother. And you know what? It's, it's, as you just made that good point, um, talking about doubting, if God doesn't know the future, how can we be assured of our salvation in the future, of what he's doing? If we can't trust that God knows the future, then how... Can we have the assurance to tell somebody to follow our God, but he doesn't know the future? He doesn't know. So how can we trust that God is going to lead us in the good and right way if he doesn't know if the way doesn't himself? Know. If he doesn't know. If he doesn't. What does it say in Job? He says he knows. Job 23. He says I, I, he knows the way that I take. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as what? Gold. If God doesn't know the path that we are going to walk, we cannot trust him to take us in the right way. What Job? That was Job what? Job 23. Job 23. I, I, don't get me on the verse on that one. He said, I know the way, he knows the way that I take him when, he shall, when, I, uh, shall, I, when I am tried to come forth his goal. And then this is the one they love to latch on to. Brother, let's go to Jeremiah 32, 35 real quick and look at that. Then we'll come back to Job. This is the one they love to latch on to right here. Major open theists right here. Oh, this is the one. We got you. We got you. Jeremiah 32, 35. Let's read that, brother. Yep, right here. Jeremiah 32, 35. It reads, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. It never came into my mind that they should do something like that. Amen. Not that they would, that they should. You know what I'm saying? God knows what was going to happen because he just predicted... In, in Deuteronomy 31, that they, that they were, were going, going to be involved in the worship of other gods, which included child sacrifice. And he mentioned that. And he yeah. mentioned that they were going to go out of the way. He mentioned but that. he never thought that they should do such a thing because right. it's evil and wicked and it's an abomination. He's saying you should never do that. He didn't say, I never thought that you would do that. He's saying that is detestable and it's an abomination. I never thought you should do such a thing. Exactly. There's a misunderstanding. It's a complete of, misunderstanding of that passage. Saying. Obviously, he knew that they were going to be serving other gods and making child sacrifices. Amen. Because it was rebuked Amen. in Deuteronomy 31 20. Exactly. Okay? This is talking about how this is an abomination. I never thought you should do something. I, I never thought you would commit such a sin. Well, not would, but should. Um, yeah. I never thought you should do such a thing. Right. That is an abomination to me. Right. It doesn't mean that God didn't factually know that they were going to do it. Right. Because we know from other verses that prove that they were going to do it. People think God doesn't know facts about something. Or he's limited by the facts. He's not limited by the facts. He has all the facts. Right. Brother, go to um, Psalm 1, 
147. Psalm 147, brother, what is it? It says that God's understanding is what? Infinite. His understanding is what? Infinite. Psalm 147, verse 5. Yes. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Infinite means there's no, there's no confines yeah. to it. There's no limit. The knowledge of God and his understanding now, what is understanding? Understanding is is not just uh, facts, but everything surrounding an event. He has the full understanding of what the intents right. behind why somebody does something. He knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and he knows the facts regarding that event. That's right. He is so his understanding is not confined by anything. Right. It's completely limitless. It's completely limitless. Brother, go to John 16, 13. Ooh, this, right here. this is key. Because this is basically the cherry on the top. This is like, you know, it's over for them. <laughs> um, they're open theists. You might as well just find another false doctrine to collapse onto. It's not going to be this one. <laughs> Read this. Oh, man. John 16, 13. This is it right here. It says, <clears throat> how be it. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, yep. for he shall not speak of himself, but who, but whatsoever he, sh he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things, things to, to come. come. He's going to show you things to come. Why? Because the spirit knows, and God is a spirit. And it's, and what does it say in, in Corinthians? It says, he that hath the spirit of God knows the mind of the spirit. Yeah, amen. He that has the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God within us knows. And it reveals things to us. He says, I'm going to reveal you things to come. <laughs> Why? Because he knows what's going to happen. Exactly. He can't reveal us things unless he knows what's going to happen. John 16, 13. And this is in the context of Jesus uh, speaking to his, um, his, his disciples. And... Um, it says, uh, sadness will turn to joy because the, the uh, apostles were sad that Jesus was going to be leaving. Because yes. when, and so what, what is the whole purpose of Jesus saying the Spirit will reveal things to you so that they can have joy about the future? Yes. So it's, he said you're going to be sorrowful, but your sorrow is going to turn to joy. joy. Because of what's coming yes. in the future. The Spirit will reveal to you what is coming in the future. It's like pen drop. <laughs> it's like, that's it. I mean, open theism is just not true. I don't care if pen hook said it, or pitchfork said it. I don't care who said it. It's not of God. It's not of God. You know, I don't care if there was a, there was a philosopher or somebody, some theologian in 321 AD that talked about it. I don't care. I don't care if it was 521, 821, whoever, it doesn't matter. What does the Bible say? Who are you following? Are you following the word of Almighty God whose word is settled forever in heaven? Are you following Guilford Pinhook? You know, it's just like... Praise God to... Uh, you get this. Praise God to... Uh, Paul. Praise God. Sorry, 1 John 3.20, brother. What was, what, we'll read that. Yeah, Pray, praise God to Paul Washer because yes. he said the reason how God knows the future is because he's the author of it. He's the author. He's the author of it. And he's not the author of confusion. No, he's and not. if we did know the future, there'd be nothing but confusion. If he didn't know the future, there'd be nothing but confusion. Exactly. And he's we would not have the no author hope. of confusion. We would have no hope in the future of what is to come. Oh, man. All right, 1 John... Jeremiah 29 11. I know the thoughts that I think through you said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. It says, For if our heart condemns us, this is 1 John 3 20, God is greater than our heart and he knoweth, knoweth all things. things. That's another pin drop. Boom, another pin drop. He knows all things. Meaning there isn't anything. Let's analyze that. What does that mean, brother? God knows all things. It means there's nothing God does, does it not know. No. God knows. Okay, so analyze that one more time. Read it if you don't get it. God knows all things. There's mean there's nothing that God does not know. 
I mean, God knows all things. Look, just read your Bible. Read it. God knows all things, meaning past, present, future, omniscience, foreknowledge, and he transcends the universe. And he's not bound by time. Time's not linear to him. He's not bound by a linear time scale. I heard one was one debater was trying to say, well, what time is it right now? Well, it's it's, it's 12 a.m. or it's 12 p.m. Oh, no, it's not. Because over in Ireland, it's like 8 p.m. And so God, there's no way that it could be uh, 12 right here for God. And, it, and actually, it's 8 over there for God. So God's got to be in one of these places or something. He's just making a ridiculous argument. It doesn't matter. Well, he's on Zulu time, okay? It doesn't matter. He's, he's above all that. He's past he's Zulu omnipresent. time. He's omnipresent. Exactly. <laughs> he's way outside of that. Okay, so God's not on some linear time scale. Okay, where he's going through everything that you're going through. Right. So, God's not limited by time. He's not on a time scale. Um, he's not affected by it. God doesn't get older. Okay? <laughs> Think about it. God isn't age. Okay? He's already the Ancient of Days. Amen. Okay, so if he's affected by time, that means he's going to have to age like we do. I mean, it just the whole thing is just is bogus. I just want to read Hebrews 4.13. 4, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Yeah, he sees right through it. Just like he watched Abel getting killed by Cain. And when he asked him, where is your brother? It's not because he didn't know. Okay. Just, these scriptures are just... There are things called rhetorical questions sometimes where God will ask a question where it's not something to get an answer from somebody or because he's trying to obtain facts because he's trying to get people to think about their actions. For, uh, this is Psalms 139 verse 4. For there is not a word in my tongue but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. So he already knows the words before we're going to even speak it. He knew the sentence I was going to tell you right before I said it. Exactly. According to the scripture. So he knows your thoughts. Yeah. He knows the words you're going to speak before you say it. Yep. And he knows your actions before you do it. Yeah. So case closed on your little open theism. Case closed. I, 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 don't, in fact, I don't even, like I said, I'm frustrated that, would, yeah. that we actually have to do a teaching defending God on his knowledge of the future. Do we, that, that's sad. It's sad that there's actually street preachers, and most of them are street preachers, I hate to tell you. Most of them are street preachers. preachers, Street preachers that deny original sin. They deny that God has limitless foreknowledge. It's ridiculous. Okay? And they go out there and they make these ridiculous statements about how that God's knowledge is somehow limited. Because, uh, they, because they read it in a church history book. Yes. Yeah. Or they read something from the Reformation. Or they read something else, and now they they're now smarter than the Bible now, and they're smarter than God because they, or God's just as smart as they are, because God's learning along with them. And man's more sovereign than God. The whole thing is just a complete stop street preaching. Just try to yeah. It's, stop if street you don't preaching. believe that God is smart enough, quote unquote, to know the future, then you don't have enough faith to be a street preacher. You have a real, a real lack of faith, a real lack of trust. You don't need to be preaching the gospel. You need to be learning the, the word of God before you start communicating to other people. Because that's it's inaccurate, it's wrong, and it's a mischaracterization of God. You're making God a liar because God is not a man that he should lie. You're confining God to a box. or putting limits on God just like Israel did. And they were punished for that. They were punished. Because they doubted God's abilities. And when you make statements about the, 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 the limited nature of God's knowledge, you are putting limits on God and you're doubting God's abilities. And that's something that God hates. God hates it when we doubt. And the reason why God sent the quails and the people started gorging, gorging themselves and then all of a sudden they start dying in the next verse and you're trying to figure out what on earth happened here. Why are all the people just like, you know, dying after mm -hmm. eating all the quail? 
It's because they had no faith. You're right. They were mocking. They were. They were. They were uh, doubting God that He had the ability to even bring the quails in the first place. And then when He brought the quails, then they started lusting exceedingly, and God was upset. And the Bible says the fire burned them upon them. Yeah. It was called Kibrath Nateva because they, there they buried the the men who lusted. They wanted to consume it upon their own lust, and they doubted God in the process. God, you don't have the ability. To, can, can you slain all the all the herds for us? Can God set a table for us in the wilderness? Can He give us flesh to eat? Can God really know the future? Yeah, that's Jeremiah one five. We we use this verse yes. a lot when it comes to abortion, but it, it works. It, I mean, it's powerful. Yes. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Before he was even formed. Wait a second. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. That means before he was even conceived, God knew him. Before his parents thought of him, of having a child, God had already knew. And you think about it. Jeremiah's mom and dad, though we don't, or he was the son of Hilkiah, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, Hilkiah and his mother... Yep. Had to make a free decision, okay, to come together and have a relationship and have a child. Mm -hmm. They had to make a free, independent decision to do that, Hilkiah and his wife, to have Jeremiah. And yet, God still was able to know Jeremiah before he was even formed. Uh, uh. What was Matthew 20, 17, brother? Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, that was Oh, the Jesus prediction predict of Christ's death. Let me... <laughs> and not only was it predicted, but it was predicted in... He didn't in say, detail. I'm just going to die. In detail. He didn't say, oh, I'm just going to die. And then it could be like all these... The, it's like a vague statement that could be fulfilled in all these different ways. No. He said, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be spit upon. And I'm going to be crucified. And I'm also going to rise the third day. There was tons of facts was right there. predicted in detail. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, unto the scribes. Yep, both. And they, sh and they shall be condemned. They shall condemn him to death. Yep. They shall deliver him up to the Gentiles. Yes. To mock, to scourge, to crucify, and on the third day he shall rise again. When he was delivered to the Gentiles, he was handed over to the Romans. Why? Because the Jews didn't have the power to put him to death. Put By to their death. law, he was he should have died, but they weren't allowed to put him to death exactly. because they were under the Roman occupation. Exactly. And they were not allowed to, to put people to death. Jesus had to... Even... They couldn't even have stoned the woman they committed adultery legally. Right. That's why they were trying to trick Jesus. When they brought the woman that was committing adultery, they wanted to get Jesus to stone her so that he'd get in trouble with the Romans. Romans. Because he wasn't allowed to stone anybody. Under the law of Moses, they could, but not under the Roman occupation. It was a trap. The whole thing was a trap anyway. Mm -hmm. That's and actually so, a good point. The reason why he was delivered over the Gentiles is because the Jews couldn't do the deed themselves. So they had to use another party had to get involved in order to put Christ to death. Another independent, wow, free-thinking, yes. decision-making party had to get involved in order to put him to death. It couldn't just be the Jews, and it couldn't just be the Gentiles. God had to use both, and he did. It says he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, and by wicked hands was slain and crucified, Acts 2.23. Unbelievable. Yet we still have people saying that God's learning along with us. God's just in it with us. Uh, he doesn't know what we're going to do tomorrow. He doesn't know if we're going to go, you know, down to the, the bar and get drunk tomorrow. Exactly. Doesn't know. Eat, doesn't know. Eat and drink for tomorrow we die. There's no... <laughs> you know, Guys, this is very clear. I mean, it's very it, clear it, it's in very Scripture. very clear. It's, I mean, it's unbelievably current, clear in Scripture. Uh, you need to study the attributes of God. I think that's what's happened, brother. Yeah. People have gotten away from understanding God's God divine is. attributes, His justice, His mm -hmm. deity, all the different attributes of God. There's 26 attributes of God. You need to study them out. They're all in well, Scripture. Well, I mean, they got all these TikTok preachers telling them that uh, God is only love. Oh, well, they got the TikTok preachers now telling them that Jesus isn't the only way. He's not the only way. He accepts homosexuals. I can't say that. I'll probably get banned from YouTube. Uh, the trans, 
He accepts them all. Just live however you want. That's not the God of the Bible. You have an, your own God. It's a God you've created in your own image. Like you said, brother, read your Bibles. Yeah. Read your Bibles. I, I just uh, Daniel 2.22, he knows the deep and secret things. The deep and secret things. Things that cannot be known on the surface. He said, does, does not interpretation belong unto the Lord? That was Joseph, I'm sorry. That was Joseph. He said, does not interpretation belong to the Lord? Amen. When he, when he told that to, to Pharaoh. Yeah. God was giving him the interpretation. He gave him the dreams, the remember? Dream. Yep, yep, yep. He knew what was going to happen 14 years in advance. The, the seven years of plenty, and then the seven, seven years, years of famine, then yep. he knew exactly what was going to be happening at the end of those 14 years. Who gave him that knowledge? Who gave him those dreams? <laughs> yep. It's clear in Scripture, brothers and sisters, it's clear in Scripture. God's not limited. His knowledge is not limited. He's not confined to a box. And you have to stop mischaracterizing God. Amen? Amen. I think we covered it in detail. I know there's a little bit more in Psalm 139 that we could have gone through. Um, that's a really deep psalm if you really want to study out the, the limitless foreknowledge of God. Um, we didn't go over a couple of those. But I think for the most, most part we did. Um, we made, we hit all the, the major points. I'll read that one. Yeah. Psalm 139, yeah. 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Uh, of me. Yeah, of, of me. It was just like I was just writing out... Um, everything about the life of David before he was even born. Before he was even born. It was all pinned. You know? He's sovereign. God is sovereign. God's a sovereign God. He's sovereign. He's you know? a sovereign God. And if, if if those of you who will probably watch this or those uh, who are still going to latch on to this false doctrine, um, I mean, brother, what would you say to them? Um... You're, you're, you're mischaracterizing God and you're limiting him and it's a lack of faith. That's what I would say. Are you going to definitely go to hell for believing this? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that God will probably may discipline you for it and show you that it's wrong. I hope that you're learning that from us today that it's wrong. Um, but it's, it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith. It really is. It's, uh, you don't want to do that to God. You don't put God in a box. You don't bind him. When the script when the scripture's super clear about his limitlessness. Amen. It's super clear. It was almost like the imputed righteousness. It's super clear. Right. It says that multiple times in Romans four and five about the righteousness was imputed as a free gift. Not something that we earn, not something we can buy, not something that we through our righteous, you know, deeds can attain. Right. It's given to us as a gift from God. Because of what Christ did at the cross. It's so clear. Amen. These are so clear. You want to pray? Yes. Father God, we thank you for this teaching. We pray, Father, for everybody that watches it. We pray that everybody's edified by it. And that people would grow yes, Lord. in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord God, only we can grow in knowledge. You cannot grow in knowledge. Because you already know all things. Amen, Lord. In Christ's name. Amen. Praise God. Amen.